Let's pray together. Lord, once again, we come into your presence. We come thankful for the promise that when we gather in your name, you're in our midst, uh, that your Holy Spirit guides us and directs us. We ask again, Lord, that the words of my mouth, the meditations and thoughts of all of our hearts together would be pleasing and acceptable, Lord, in your sight. For, Lord, you're our rock. You're our redeemer. Amen. Well, I pay a lot of attention to uh, surveys about religion. Uh, I, I like surveys. I like keeping up with what's happening in our nation as it relates to religion and Christianity and things like that. I like the surveys. I don't always like the results. And I ran across something in Newsweek from a couple of years ago that was the results of a survey that asked the question, who was Jesus? And there was a multitude of answers that people could give, including the Son of God uh, and other answers as well. And here is the, the headline from Newsweek magazine that really startled me and depressed me. 52% of Americans say Jesus isn't God but was a great teacher. So that's the majority. Here's the opening sentence from that article in Newsweek. A slight majority of American adults say Jesus was a great teacher and nothing more during his lifetime. A slim majority of Americans say, adults say that Jesus was a great teacher and nothing more during his lifetime. Now, I'm not sure that other surveys would back that up. Of course, there were folks, uh, close to 40%, who did say that he was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God. But the fact that the majority of Americans say, well, he was, he was a great teacher. He was right up there with Plato and Buddha and, you know, other great teachers. But, but that's it. He was a really great teacher, a great moral leader. That's who those folks said, that's who Jesus was and is. Now, 2,000 years ago, Jesus did a survey, except it was a survey of 12 men. And he asked them the same question. Who am I? Who do you believe me to be? Who do you say that I am? And Jesus had taken them up to a place called Caesarea Philippi, which was kind of out of the way, almost like a retreat. And he took the 12 disciples and they had this time together and he could tell it was going to be a turning point it was very serious and Jesus just threw this question at his disciples who do you say that I am and they began to say well this is what the crowds are saying this is what other people are saying matter of fact they said some people think you're John the Baptist come back to life you know for the last several weeks I was talking about John the Baptist and if you remember last week, if you were here last week, or if you heard the message last week, I talked about how John died, how Herod Antipas uh, had him in prison, didn't want to kill him, but his wife Herodias was insistent that he kill John the Baptist, and through using a manipulative way through her own daughter, through Herod's stepdaughter, got John the Baptist beheaded. And that's how John the Baptist died. But we read in the Bible this, uh, Matthew 14, 1 to 2. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus. And he said to his attendants, this is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. That's why miraculous powers are at work in him. So when Herod heard about Jesus, the miracle worker, he thought, oh, no. Oh no, the man I killed has, has come back to life. He's going to come and get me. He's got miraculous powers. So Herod thought that Jesus was actually John the Baptist, resurrected. So some of the disciples say, well, some of the people think you're John the Baptist. And they probably kind of chuckled at that because, of course, they'd seen the two of them together. Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. So they kind of threw that out there like, well, you know what some people think? They think you're John the Baptist. Like, isn't that kind of ridiculous? And they said, well, some people say that you're Elijah. Some people say that you're Jeremiah or one of the Old Testament prophets who's returned. But then Jesus asked them the, uh, the million shekel question. He's like, no, I'm not interested in what right now in what other people are saying about me. I want to know what you believe. Who do you say that I am? 
who do you believe me to be? And we know, we're not sure if there was a pause or if it was immediate, but Simon speaks up. Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. Now when Jesus says, you're blessed, Simon, God has revealed this to you. Now, my guess is that the disciples may have at least thought about this before, that perhaps was who Jesus was because they'd seen him do miracles. They'd seen him heal lepers. They'd seen him heal the blind and the deaf. They'd, they'd seen him drive out demons. They'd seen him walk on water. And they'd seen him actually talk to the wind and talk to the waves and say, calm down. And when he spoke to the wind and he spoke to the waves, the wind and the waves obeyed him. And if you remember, when he did that, the disciples said to each other, who is this guy? Well, man. They said, who is this man that can command the wind? Who is this man? As if to say, this is not just a man. This is not just a great teacher. Who is this guy? So probably they, at least among themselves, had speculated, is he the Messiah? He keeps calling himself the Son of Man. But here, finally, out loud... Simon says it. He says, you are the Son of God. You're the Messiah. And it's at that point Jesus gives him the nickname Peter. Now, I know the authors refer to him as Peter all the way through, but he doesn't get the nickname until that moment. He says, Simon, son of Jonah, I'm going to call you Peter, which is a nickname that means the rock. I'm going to call you the rock. Now, and, and Simon, Simon Peter, he had the nickname long, long before Dwayne Johnson, okay? Long before Dwayne Johnson had the name The Rock, Peter had it first. And I love this painting of Peter because, yeah, Peter was a fisherman, remember? Spent hour after hour pulling in nets full of fish. He had some guns, you know? Peter had, Peter had, was not some little, you know, he, he would work physically. So there, that's a painting of Peter I really like. But he was the rock before Dwayne Johnson was the rock. And so he says, you're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. And only once that was spoken out loud, only once that was on the table, does Jesus then pivot the whole conversation. Once the word Messiah has finally been said, the M word has finally been said, Jesus changes the conversation and says this. And we read this a moment ago, but let's read it now from the New Living. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders and the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, and on the third day he would be raised from the dead. That's what Jesus began to teach. And at that, the rock, Peter, said, uh-uh, that's not going to happen. Not on my watch. No, no, sir. No, Lord. That's never, they're not going to kill you. That is not going to happen. Never, never, never. We won't let that happen. We won't let them kill you. That is not going to happen. You are not going to be killed. At what point Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. Satan. And that's two nicknames in a pretty short amount of time. The Rock and Satan. That's, that's a pretty harsh turn to go from being the Rock to being Satan. But remember, this word, Satan, and I was actually taught the right pronunciation is Satan, and it's actually the Satan. It means the adversary. The adversary, the enemy. The full quote is there Matthew 16 23 get behind me Satan you're a stumbling block to me you don't have the mind you don't have in mind the concerns of God merely human concerns now when he calls him adversary Satan Satan I tend to think and I'm not alone in this I tend to think that Jesus is flashing back to his time with the actual Satan in the desert 
the time at the beginning of his ministry when Jesus is in the desert on a fast, on a prayer retreat of his own. He's spending time alone in the desert fasting and praying and Satan comes to tempt him. And there's three temptations. You remember Satan says, hey, you're hungry. Use your miraculous powers to make food for yourself. You know, use your powers to just make some bread. Come on. And Jesus says, we don't live by just physical food. We live on the word of God. That's what nourishes us. I'm not here to use my powers just to serve my own needs. And so Satan takes him up to the top of the temple and says, jump off because you know God won't let you die. He'll catch you. The angels will catch you and you'll get a big crowd. They'll go, what a miracle. They'll go, this guy is awesome amazing. This guy is sent from God. You'll have all kinds of prestige and power and admirers all at once. Just jump and do something amazing. Do an amazing stunt. And then he quotes the Bible. Satan quotes the Bible. The Bible says God won't let his beloved's foot hit the ground. And Jesus quotes the Bible back to him. It also says don't put God to a stupid test. But the final one is probably the one that really Jesus was reminded of in that moment with Simon Peter when Satan says, showed him the kingdoms of the world and said, you know, you don't have to go through all this pain and suffering and heartache. And if you'll just work with me, if you'll just, you know, wink at me, bow down to me, cooperate with me. I can give you the whole world without all the pain, without all the suffering, without the cross. You and I can just work together on this. And Jesus says, be gone, Satan. We worship God alone. When Peter says, you don't have to go to Jerusalem to die, I think Jesus flashed back to that moment with Satan because Peter was really saying, no, 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 don't, don't die. You're the Messiah. You're the king. You're the, you're the conqueror. You don't, you're not going to die. Now, I don't think Peter thought that, I don't, I don't think that Jesus thought that Peter was literally Satan any more than he thought that Peter was literally a, a rock. But he uses that phrase, and notice he tells the actual Satan, be gone. Be gone, Satan. He tells Simon Peter, get behind me. And I don't think that just means, like, get away from me. I think it means, hey, I'm the leader here. <laughs> You're the rock, but I'm, I'm, the, I'm in charge. You need, to, you need to get behind me. You need to follow me. I'll tell you what we're doing, and then you need to back me up, and you need to follow me. You need to have my back. Get, get behind me. And once he gets Peter back in line, basically, he then says something even a little more challenging. And we, again, read it, but here it is from the message, a, a more modern paraphrase from Matthew 16, 24. He says, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. We call it a paraphrase because obviously Jesus didn't say, I'm in the driver's seat. Um, the message tries to find modern expressions that help us understand Jesus' intent. But... It is a matter of letting Jesus take the wheel and saying, we're in the passenger seat, he's in the driver's seat. It's about following him. And it's about understanding that if we grasp our life in such a way that we say, life is about me, myself, and I. It's about my wants, my needs. It's all about me. And, and Jesus says, if you act like that, you're going to lose your life. If you give your life to me, you're going to find it. You're going to find it. He says, pick up your cross, and again, metaphorically saying, following me isn't always going to be easy. Following me isn't always going to be comfortable. 
but it's the path to real life, abundant life, true life. That path may have some hard spots to it, but it's the path to real life. Now, you know, holidays fall different times. We had the Ash Wednesday fall on Valentine's Day this year. Uh, well, today happens to be St. Patrick's Day. You know, and as a kid, I, I didn't really understand anything about that when I was a little kid, except you got to wear green or you'll get pinched. Uh, so my mom made sure I, I wore green on, on St. Patrick's Day if it was a weekday. That's about the, only, that's the extent of what I understood. That's the day we wear green. I don't know why, but you better, not, you better wear it. Then uh, I saw decorations and like, oh, it's the guy from the Lucky Charms commercial, you know? <laughs> It's the guy, you know, always after me lucky charms, you know. It's that guy, and, and this is, has something to do with him, I guess. And I didn't like lucky charms because I don't like marshmallows. But anyway, it had something to do with him. And then, you know, you get older and you start to go, okay, there's leprechauns and pots of gold and rainbows and things. And then I got to college at OU, and, and my first year there, all these... Uh, I would say morons, but I, I guess I won't use that word. These morons, we would get up at 7 a.m. to go drink green beer at O'Connell's. And, and why are you drinking any kind of beer at 7 in the morning? Much less green beer, but that was a thing in college, to drink green beer first thing in the morning. Um, not me, but some guys were doing that. And I'm like still thinking, this is a weird holiday. And then I finally, somewhere along the line, start to learn about who is this Patrick guy? Who is this Patrick fellow? Well, we are fortunate that Patrick actually wrote stuff. <laughs> he wrote something that would be akin to an autobiography called Declaration. And so we know quite a bit about Patrick's life, about what he says about his own story. Patrick lived in the 5th century AD, so the 400s. He grew up in Great Britain, in England, and when he was 16 years old, he was kidnapped by Irish pirates, by actual pirates. So when he's 16 years old, he's kidnapped by Irish pirates who take him back to Ireland and sell him into slavery. Kind of like Joseph in the Old Testament. They kidnap the 16-year-old kid and sell him into slavery in Ireland. And for six years, he is a slave in Ireland, made to work primarily as a shepherd for those six years. When he's 24 years old, he escapes. He escapes his master, he escapes his captor, walks 200 miles to the shore, talks his way onto a boat bound for England, and gets back to his home country, gets back to England. But he talks about how during his time as a slave, which was primarily spent as a shepherd, he had a lot of time to think. He had a lot of time to pray. He knew something of Christianity. Christianity had come to England by this time, by the fifth century. Christianity had come to England. And so he knew something about Christianity. He's heard something about Christianity. He began to pray. He began to think more seriously about God in that situation. Especially since Ireland, Christianity had not come to Ireland. Ireland was a totally pagan country with no Christianity. And so when he returned to England, he got more and more interested in Christianity, more and more interested in Christ. He became a follower of Jesus. He became a Christian. And he actually became a priest, a pastor. Pastor, Patrick becomes a pastor, a priest in England, and then he has a vision. And here's how Patrick writes about his vision. He says, I saw a man coming, as it were, from Ireland. His name was Victoricus, and he carried many letters. And he gave me one of them. I read the heading, The Voice of the Irish. As I began the letter, I imagined in that moment that I heard the voice of those very people who were near the wood of Foklut, which is beside the Western Sea, and they cried out, as with one voice, We appeal to you, holy servant boy, to come and walk among us. So Patrick has this vision. 
of the people of Ireland crying out for him to come. And so Patrick did. He returned to the place of his captivity. He returned to the place where he was a slave, now as a missionary. Because as I said, Ireland was a totally polytheistic country. They believed in the old gods and goddesses. It was a polytheistic country. It was what was would call the old Celtic religion. Uh, the religious leaders were called the Druids. And actually, um, the old Irish Celtic polytheistic religions have some continuation. It's what's today called Wiccan and uh, the earth religions like that. So Ireland is a pagan polytheistic country. And he goes there as a Christian missionary and go village to village, county to county, telling people about Jesus and about the one God. Now, there's lots of legends about Patrick. Uh, some of them are not true. One of the legends is he drove the snakes out of Ireland. There were never any snakes in Ireland. So that, there's no basis in that. But at least one of the legends we think probably was true, and that was that he used the shamrock as a way to help people understand the concept of the Trinity. How could God be one God in three persons? And that he used that three-leafed shamrock as a way to help them understand this idea of the Trinity, the triune God. Patrick, of course, lived the rest of his life in Ireland, and he writes this about Ireland. He said, Never before did they know of God except to serve idols and unclean things, but now they have become the people of the Lord and are called children of God. So we always associate, of course, Patrick with Ireland. But remember, he was a British boy who went back to the place of his slavery. Talk about picking up your cross and following Jesus. He certainly went back to a place of unpleasant memories, but he went there to reach people with the good news of Jesus. He went there to help people who were lost. You know, what's sad in our world today, even in the U.S. of A., is that there's many people who don't know the good news of Jesus. They think today is about leprechauns and green beer. They think Christmas is about elves and reindeer. They think Easter is about rabbits and eggs. Now, there's nothing wrong with most of those things. I'm not sure about the green beer, but there's nothing wrong with rabbits or eggs or reindeer or, you know. But those, if that's what those holidays are about to folks, they are missing out. And that's the tragedy. They're missing out today on the story of a, a, a man who went back to a, the place where he was a slave to bring a message about Jesus. They're missing out about a baby boy born in a, in a manger, born in a cave, uh, in a stable, who came as, as God's greatest gift to humanity. They, they're missing out on the story of a rabbi and a healer who was more than just a good teacher who was the anointed one of God, who was the son of the living God. And, and it makes me sad when I see a headline like the one in, in Newsweek that so many of our fellow Americans, apparently a little over half, think that Jesus was just a great guy, a great man, a great teacher, like, like Plato or Socrates or Buddha or, you know, the Dalai Lama or, or whatever. That that's who he was. But giving my whole life to a really great teacher is not something I ever wanted to do. Making my whole life about following one really good teacher is not what I want to do. Because Jesus didn't claim to be simply a great rabbi. He said things. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I'm the vine and you're the branches. No one comes to the Father but by me. He said lots of things about himself. 
And, and it's because he said those things about himself that this idea that he was just a great rabbi just doesn't, doesn't work. As a matter of fact, anytime somebody says that, I can't help but think of, for me, one of the great paragraphs uh, I've ever read, uh, and it's from C.S. Lewis. It's from his book, Mere Christianity. And he deals with this idea, well, what, what, isn't Jesus maybe just a great teacher, a great rabbi, a great moral leader? Here's what he says about that. C.S. Lewis from Mere Christianity. Lewis says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great, more, a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. You know, the shorthand for this argument is liar, lunatic, or Lord. <laughs> that given the things that Jesus said about himself, either he was a liar, or he was a lunatic, or he was who he said he was, the Lord. He was one of those things. I don't believe he was a liar. I don't believe he was a lunatic. I don't believe he was just one of great many great teachers in the history of the world. I believe he was and is who he claimed to be, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the one who came to show us the Father. He said, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father, who came to show us God and to lay down his life that we might have eternal life the one, the only sinless man who rose again. And that's who he was, and that's who he is. That's why we worship him. That's why we're here. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for who you are and what you've done. Thank you for all that, all that you are in our lives. Lord, we pray for our world. We pray for our nation. We pray for our communities. We pray for people who know about you, but they don't know you. We pray for people who know something about you, and yet they think, well, yeah, what a, what a great guy. Lord, you are a great guy, but you're so much more. Um, help us in the way that we live our lives and the way that we talk to other people. Help us to, to show that you are more. Not to lift ourselves up, but to lift you up. Lord, we lift up you for praise and honor and glory and worship. Amen.